it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I didn't see his imaginary friend, but I saw what it did by snickering haystack. Greg and I were both pleased as punch when we saw that cottage. We'd been tramping through those woods for hours, ever since we'd hitched a ride from Perry Sound, and it was getting near midnight when we caught a glimpse of the squat little cabin. It had all the telltale signs of a summer vacation home left unoccupied and unguarded for the off-season. Closed windows, probably locked, bolted doors, a dewy fire pit, no garbage cans out, empty driveway. Shucks, there wasn't even patio furniture on the lawn or deck. This was it. Our home for possibly the next three to four weeks. And of course, Craig being Craig, he wasn't too keen on the whole thing. I don't know, Lena. He started stuttering. We got within 15 feet of the place. This might be a bad idea. This was Craig's habit. To hesitate, to protest a potentially dangerous or compromising situation. He also trekked with me for all those long hours, both of us freezing our buns off, looking for a place to squat without complaint. So, when he started up with that nonsense, I just ignored him. Eventually, he quieted down and didn't hesitate to assist me breaking into the joint. I'm not expecting it to be that easy, but... Not wanting to leave any stone unturned, we first tried the front door. Nope. Locked. Good and tight. I told Craig to circle the perimeter of the house, double check if anyone was inside or if anyone was around looking at us. We were pretty deep into this wooded camping area, so I wasn't too worried about being spotted. I'd had no luck with any windows so far or the sliding patio door. I was beginning to consider shattering the glass. When I heard Craig from around the corner hissing my name. Lena, he wheezed, making goose flesh on my arm. Lena. Crept around to where his voice was coming from. With a big goofy grin on his face, he indicated a 30-inch window, appearing just a head length above him. Check it out, he said, then reaching up, slid it open, allowing a 15-inch entrance. Me, I wasn't so stoked about the whole thing. Yes, I was happy we'd found a way in, but I was suspicious. Hey, why is this window open when all the rest are locked? I asked, like Craig owned the place. Well, he shrugged. Uh, dunno, you know, he confessed. Maybe people forgot to lock it when they left. It happens, right? I then asked him to give me a boost so I could get a better look inside. I then saw the telltale signs on the window. Dark skid marks and tiny cracks on the plastic frame. Yeah, the window had been jimmied open. <sighs> Someone's already broken in, I said. Craig didn't say anything, but his silence indicated he was getting all mopey, like he sometimes got. Well, maybe they've left, he mumbled, clearly not wanting to go back out into the woods and tramp around for another four hours, or to go another 24 hours without proper sleep. Not went to go back out either, and too tired to care. I slid the window back open. Hey, I'll let you in at the patio door, understand? I whispered down to him. Craig didn't say anything, which told me he agreed. Without another word, I maneuvered my tiny body through the open slot, my narrow hips just making the cut. I didn't bother checking for the busted window latch that was surely there. Inside, it took a while for my eyes to adjust. This wasn't my first cottage, so I didn't look around. I just made my way to the patio door, following the moonlight cast inside the room. The place smelled of camphor, citrus, and home-cooked meals. Welcome change from the usual hobo funk of eggy farts and boozy B.O. When I saw Craig standing there, I smiled. He looked to be in better spirits. I unlocked the door and let him in didn't take long for Craig's eyes to get used to the dark. Whoa, he muttered, drinking in the place. This is a real palace, eh? Yeah, yeah, I said, too exhausted to go exploring. Let's just find somewhere to crash. Then shrieked, leaping out of my skin, having heard this sudden groan issue from the darkness. Used to his every sound, 
I knew it wasn't Craig. Craig hadn't started like I had. Instead looked down at the foot of the refrigerator. I followed his gaze, both of us finding a figure in a deep corner of the kitchen, slouched next to the icebox. It was a woman. Oh, that was hard to tell from her crew cut. Advancing closer, I saw that her eyes were half open, all shiny like from tears. Greg spoke first. Yeah, you all right there? He asked, bending down to look at her. She gave another long, guttural groan. I looked up at Craig. We met eyes. He shrugged. She's probably all alone, you know, he said, giving his feeble sales pitch. And it's only her, right? I mean, no need to leave now, you know. We can just stay here and find another room, right? Zeroing in on the huddled mass of skin and bones, I noticed something disturbing about her appearance. She was wearing just a t-shirt. Despite how cold it was, and on her exposed arms, I could see dark brown track marks, along with dry scabs on her face of a similar color. Oh, shoot, I exclaimed. This broad's a drug addict. A fiend. Can't lay your head down around somebody like that. You can't trust them. Another low moan escaped the husk of flesh. Hey, I shouted too loud, trying to get her attention. Hey, I repeated, nudging the woman with my toe. Why don't you get out of here? There ain't no dope here for you to score, so just hit the bricks. Sorry to anyone listening to this, but I've always hated drugs and the people who take them. Both of my parents were druggies and did some real horrible stuff that I'd rather not get into here. Craig shuffled over to me. Ah, oh, come on, Lena, he said. There's no need for that there. I don't want to share quarters with some dope fiend, I kept on. Come on, Lena, Craig pleaded. She has the same right to be here as we do, you know. To this, I spun on my heel. What? I balked. You and me and this degenerate dope laying here ain't the same. Not by a dang sight. And then I heard her speak. You should die, she wheezed, more breath than English. You both should die. Won't make any difference to me. You're the same as the bugs under my feet. Oh, Craig and I both looked at each other. The fiend's eyes opened a little wider, her pupils staring up into vapid space. Won't make any difference. Your life or the life of a single candle. Bones crushed. All the crushed bones of a field mouse. Shh, go jump off a bridge, I cussed at her, ready to let the matter drop and find a comfy spot somewhere in the house. Now, I didn't notice at the time, but had I paid any mind to Craig, I would have probably noticed that after hearing the sociopathic ramblings of that nodding doper, his face had taken on a grim, morose expression. Pallor, I saw later, was quite blanched. Not too tired to go exploring, Craig and I settled on the living room couch near the fireplace grate, only about twenty feet apart from where that nihilistic junkie was laying her head. Yeah, got a little surprise for you, Craig whispered, reaching deep into his voluminous raincoat. Unable to suppress a smile, I almost whooped when I saw the fifth of bourbon in his hand. Hey, I said, elbowing him. You've been holding out on me. Well, oh, just saving it for the right time, you know. He smiled wryly. Huddled in barn there. Oh, you got the good stuff. In one fluid motion, Craig had cracked the seal, unscrewed the cap and taken a long swig of the dark amber before passing the bottle over to me. I drank, the sweet woody taste finding my sinuses, the velvet euphoria making its way down my throat and up my spine. I exhaled, smacking my lips, appraising the whiskey. I prefer rye, but well, that's what my grandpa used to drink. But the stuff was good. I promptly passed it back to Craig, and we continued on like that for a good while, draining the bottle near empty like we often did. The two of us giggling and joshing each other. That dope fiend's groans of protest, the only buzzkill. After the bottle had been drained a good way south, Craig and I got cozy on the couch. 
Craig especially cozied up next to me, putting his arm around my shoulders, getting all touchy-feely like he always did when he was drunk. Ordinarily, that kind of bunk gets on my nerves. I don't like being touched, and to be honest, I'm not into dudes. But Craig's harmless, and this was his routine. Getting cozy without expectation, spilling me all warm and fuzzy with me. I really didn't mind. It was only Craig. Kind of romantic, even. Crickets chirping outside the musky cabin, the moonlight and all. Now the liquor had muddled up my brain some, making me bolder than usual, as it does. So I decided to ask Craig some of the questions I'd had on my mind since we'd first met and had begun thumbing down the Trans-Canada Highway all these months. Hey, Craig, I drawled, my voice just abreast of slurring. Yeah, Lena, he drooled happily. Why did you grow up again? His eyes squelched closed. I felt his shoulders heaving a little like he was laughing silently. I surmised it was a painful memory. Ah, oh, little town up north, he muttered with a forced mirth. Barely a thousand people, right? <laughs> oh, redneck Canucks, eh? Like on that show, Corner Gas, you know? I nodded politely. I already knew this much. So, I needled. What made you go on and start tramping, squatting? Everything you told me about your folks sounds on the up and up. Why'd you leave? Why'd you start hitching? Soldiering these roads and all. In the dark, I could see that warm whiskey grin beginning to melt from his thin, whisker curtain lips. I felt bad for putting him through such a ringer. Still, I had a nagging need to know, to learn his story. That started when I was a teenager in high school, he began cryptically. I was 15 years old, just a kid. I wish I could change what I'd done. He broke off then, his voice growing damp. Still, I eagerly extended an ear to my road buddy. I started with a prank, a practical joke, you know. I turned 15 that summer, me and my best friend, Jeremy Swan. Swan and I weren't exactly juvenile delinquents, right? More like the local deadbeats. We each shoplift small items from convenience stores, smash up street lamps at night, smoke cigarettes in the school lavatory, that kind of stuff, you know. Nothing too major. We used to skateboard, but, <laughs> if you can believe it, the mayor or city council or whatever had skateboarding banned within the town limits. <laughs> can you believe that? Banning skateboarding. It didn't make much of a difference, though. Swan and I weren't any good to begin with. Plus, we just embraced being pariahs. So it was an excuse to continue our lethargic, deadbeat existence. Getting drunk, smoking reefer when we could, and just pissing on everything decent or noble. We wouldn't have considered ourselves as such, but in retrospect, we were kind of the neighborhood bullies. That's where Andy Byan comes in. He was a short kid, two grades behind us. Lived around Saul Laskin Lake. We used to call him the terrorist because he was Arab looking. We'd holler terrorist at him. He'd get all crazy. Yelling at the top of his lungs about how he wasn't Arab or even Middle Eastern. He was actually Armenian or Ukrainian. <laughs> something like that. Of course, that only made us want to call him it even more. That's another thing. While Swan and me were older and bigger than Andy, he had twice the mouth on him. And I mean a mouth on him. Oh, he could talk a blue streak, that kid. I'd always brag about how he'd skipped a grade back when he was in primary school, and how he read at a grade 12 level. Everybody in this town, except him, was dumber than a bag of rocks, and on and on. Well, truth be told, I sort of liked him, you know. Kind of admired his spunk, he ran into the same bands and video games, and what have you. Swan, though, he, he just hated the little prick. I never could quite put my finger on it. I didn't even care that Andy's father had died of pancreatic cancer way back when Andy was only five. I thought it was funny how Andy's grandparents had perished in that genocide from way back in the day. Not the Holocaust in World War II, mind you. <laughs> the other one. That one in Turkey or Cyprus or something. <sighs> I guess looking back, Andy kind of had his reasons for being the little spitfire that he was. It's when everything goes bad for you, you got to get an attitude. Well, that and tough skin. Not speaking of tough skin, it's another thing about Andy. 
He never cried during a beatdown. Anytime, whether it was red ass or a wedgie, or just a good old fashioned pummeling, to a one, of course, he'd just take it. He'd cuss us out like a blue streak, right? But otherwise, he'd take his lickings like a champ. The best of times, we'd prank him into taking a beatdown. Yeah, it was one late morning in the summer, July, I think it was, and he wanted to challenge me in a game of poker. Despite his age, he didn't play with Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon, or even Magic the Gathering. He did all them with the babies. Well, we were pretty bored, all of us, that day. The sun was high and hot. The streets were baking. Didn't like going outside to begin with, right? So we all gathered in my parents' basement, dragged out the card table, a couple of fold-out chairs, and had us a game. Swan was there, too, but he didn't play. Sitting on my orange beanbag in the corner, he just tuned us out with his walkman, having a piece of driftwood he'd found from the creek with his pocket knife, not looking at us. I only seemed bored by the whole thing, but actually bothered. Well, I didn't say anything, but it really got on my nerves that day. After all, poke is much better with three than it is with just two. I guess he really just couldn't stand Andy's guts, you know. No, I beat that sucker five to zero. Twice with a royal flush, once with a straight, and once with me just bluffing him out of his pot. I don't remember how much, but I collected a fair amount of change, right? Also, after five hands, I was worn out. Poker with two people gets real monotonous, you know. So I figured it was time for me to mosey on upstairs. I lay down on the sofa and just let the tube wash over me till I fell asleep. Andy, though, and he was having none of that. Demanding we play one more hand. They kept on after me, even though I'd already collected up the cars and started folding up the chairs. He kept taunting me, saying how he was only warming up, but he was now going to whoop me. More out of curiosity than anything, I asked him, half-hearted like, expecting a good laugh, why he was so adamant about us playing another hand. He didn't really answer me, but told me he wanted to play for my gold watch, the one my dad had given me, the one I'd been wearing since grade seven. Looking at me with that wry smile of his, Craig peeled back a baggy cotton sleeve, revealing a glinting Rolex I'd never noticed around his left wrist. I won't lie, I thought pretty hard just then about nabbing it while he was asleep. He was my road buddy and all, but hey, money's money. Now, speaking this all out, I feel like crud, even having thought that. It must have meant something real dear to old Craig, not having pawned it. Ah, oh, this got my ire up a bit, you know. Craig continued with his story. At least a bit. This was my watch that was given to me by my pop for my birthday. I wasn't about to put it on the line in a game of cards. And still, I was curious. So I asked Andy, What about you? What you putting up? My well, kid said if he won, Swan and I could do anything we wanted to. Of course, us being teens, Swan and I busted a gut laughing at the way he said it. Swan saying, sorry Andy, sarcastic, you're not my type. Something like that, you know. Swan didn't help me put away anything, but he stood up from the beanbag, blade of his knife sticking out. Well, Andy then insisted. Yeah, fine, call me a sissy if you want. Except he didn't use the word sissy, mind you. I said, take any kind of beating you want to give me. Swan then said in a low, icy voice, you wouldn't walk away from it, the beating I'd want to give you. And there were some hard words exchanged between the two of them, Andy puffing his chest out, looking ridiculously adorable on account of his size, a swan lumbering over to him, that blade still out. Around this time, I tried to intervene, hoping cool heads would prevail and all. But I'd come to a standoff, swan looming over Andy with that blade, Andy staring up at him with his chest out. If Darren Swan to poke him. Oh, after a nerve wracking minute, Swan finally folded the blade back into his place, punching Andy hard in the shoulder with the same hand. Still, I sighed with relief. No stabbing. Andy then asked if he could just borrow the deck and play solitaire while Swan and me watched the tube upstairs. And I threw it over to him, acting all tough and mean, said, Sure, go ahead and play with yourself, little Terry. 
I tried to force a laugh at my little joke, but neither Swan nor Andy stirred. Something sinister seemed to have settled over the both of them. Swan and I sat down on my dad's leather upholstered Davenport upstairs. Before he could even reach the remote, I told Swan about a card trick in No good way to cheat someone in poker. Swan brightened. More life and optimism than I'd ever seen in the guy, truth be told. He said, Hey, you think you can win with it? I blew out my mouth, all cocky-like, and said, No doubt. Like a bauble head on a dashboard, Swan nodded, his eyes on me, not blinking. Then he muttered, Right, let's go. Let's do it, then. Well, the two of us sauntered down the steps to the basement, finding Andy alone at the table then told him he was on for another hand at poker and agreed to the stakes. Only one new condition. This was my house and my deck of cards. I got to deal. Without hesitating, Andy agreed. You already know that I knew I had him right. It was like taking candy from a baby. What was your trick? I asked. His lips parted behind his ratty beard, his teeth glinting in the moonlight. I never actually shuffled the cards. What I did instead is called a false strip. When I cut the deck, I made sure the joker and all four aces were on top. And while stripping, I bent the top card slightly with my finger. That way I'd always know where those cards were. Since there'd be a small bulge in the deck. Anyone who'd know what to look for would have easily seen pretty quick what I was doing. X Swan probably saw me do it just because he knew I was pulling a trick on Andy. Andy, though, Mr. 4.0 grade point average, never questioned it. So as you probably figured out by now, I won that hand in poker. Andy belly ached about how I must have cheated, but it was par for the course with him, so even he didn't take what he was saying serious. Swan was the first to speak up. You ready for your beating? I can still remember the sound of his voice, cold and flinty. When I heard that voice, in my head... Jeremy Swan had gone from a cold fish to something else entirely. I don't know, like something just evil. Andy pursed his lips and sulked, but like always, he agreed. This is where things took an unfortunate turn. Maybe this is why I started tramping. Swan suggested that for his beating, we drop him like a bag of potatoes onto my driveway, back first. I didn't like the idea. I thought that would be too much. But even Andy got all brave and said he'd be no worse than falling off his bike in a real bad accident. Before I continue, I know. I know how stupid and reckless all this sounds, but... Well, I mean, we were dumb kids in the middle of nowhere town in frozen who-gives-a-fuck northern Ontario. Doesn't excuse what we did, but... Anyway, Swan took Andy by the legs him by the arms and we carried him out from the garage. It was actually pretty heavy, I remember. Got into the middle of the drive, into position. I start counting down. One, two, three. Now, from my understanding of the whole thing was that we were just going to do a dead drop. Just let Andy fall from our arms to the pavement. Seems fair, right? We weren't going to really hurt him. He fell from our arms. It would only be a two-foot drop or so. I let go of Andy's arms. His legs threw straight up into the air, and I saw his tennis shoes lunging toward my face. It's like that big move on the wrestling show, a pile driver or something. He landed vertical, head first on the driveway, his legs folding over his face, then shooting out. Before he was face down, prostrate, unmoving heap. I don't remember there being a crack like the sound of his neck giving or his skull staving in. You'd think I would have heard something like that. Maybe I did, but I don't remember it. I just recall the thud of his head hitting the pavement. It didn't sound like a person's skull getting cracked. It didn't even sound like a heavy stone landing. It was more like the sound of clothes getting shuffled around, like when your mom's doing the laundry and there's a loud bang in the washing machine. My eyes must have bugged out in my head, man. You know when people say their jaw fell to the floor? That's exactly what happened to me. Horrified, I stared down at Andy's motionless body. 
Then looked up at Swan, my eyes all big, my mouth hanging wide open like a ransacked cupboard drawer. Indifferently, Swan stared back at the most vacant of expressions, the emptiest of eyes. We didn't say anything for a while. Then Swan muttered, We were going to toss him on three. I then blew my stack right there, hollering at Swan something awful about how we'd agreed to just let him drop on three. About how it wouldn't make sense for me to toss him up from my end. How we must have killed him. Swan's expression never changed. He didn't even seem bothered by my hollering. Or the situation, now that I think of it. Let's turn him over, he said in a scratchy voice. What? I blurted. Let's turn him over, he said. See if he's okay. I insisted that was a bad idea. What if he'd broken his neck? Turning him over would only make it worse. Swan didn't listen. Before I could say Jack Robinson, Swan had kneeled down and was turning Andy over into his back by the shoulders. Not knowing what to do, being a stupid kid at home with both parents away at work, I knelt down beside Swan and eagerly watched him examine Andy, now on his back. Oh, it was worse than I thought. Worse than what I could ever have imagined in my entire life. Andy had broken his neck. No, we had broken his neck. And he... He was still alive. His head just lolled around on the pavement like a tether ball on a string. His white frothy foam bubbling on his lips. His eyes were the only part of him that was still normal. Flashed at me with what I can only guess now was a mixture of anger, confusion, and absolute terror. It, uh, it still makes my throat all choky and my eyes all misty thinking about it. Hey, pass that bottle over, will you? Anyway, still wearing that mask of frigid apathy, Swan observed Andy's crippled form, his eyes locking under the kid's face, not really seeing him. He's just faking it, he said, sneering, pinching Andy on the cheek. He'll start laughing at any moment now. But Andy never did. Never would laugh or talk ever again. Go get me a pillow, Swan then said in a flinty voice. What? I asked. Go get me a pillow from inside, he repeated, punctuating every word. And again, being a stupid kid, afraid to get into trouble... Not knowing CPR, not knowing what the hell to do, not knowing what the laws were about this sort of thing. Ran into my house and came back with a detachable cushion from the Davenport said he. Yeah, I think this one's good, I said, offering it to Swan. It's nice and firm, so to keep his neck in place. Swan didn't tuck the cushion beneath Andy's head. Instead he looked round, making sure the coast was clear. He leaned over Andy and began to smother him. What, what do you think you're doing? I cried out, getting all teary-eyed and choky. He's going to die anyway, was Swan's eyes cold reply. His hands busy mashing the pillow into the poor kid's face. This is so he doesn't suffer. I tried to beg him off. What about fighting him? But I didn't. <laughs> I couldn't. A few kids on bikes flew past us, glancing over but not stopping. Probably figuring we were playing doctor or something. Well, I just started blubbering like a baby, pacing in a circle, wringing my hands together, waiting for it to end. Then it did. Probably only took two minutes, but I swear to the Lord, it felt like hours. Slowly, Swan peeled the cushion from Andy's face. Peering down through my splayed fingers, I saw that confused, frightened fury had gone from the little guy's eyes. Now his whole body was still, lifeless. Then pitched forward and puked mac and cheese and grape soda pop all over my parents' driveway. I didn't even wipe my mouth when Swan said to me, We have to get rid of the body. I looked at him all bug eyed and started to dry heave. I insisted we get rid of it. So we wrapped Andy in a blanket I stole from my parents' linen closet and stuffed him inside a canoe that I'd had hanging out from the rafters of the garage. For appearances, we placed some tackle and fishing rods in case anyone noticed, as well as a roll of duct tape. Oh, if anyone had seen us, 
They would probably wonder why we were carrying the canoe upright instead of portage in it. Well, we marched to the nearest body of water, both of us whinging from the incredible weight. We went to a giant pond not far from our high school called Soul Laskin Lake. At the time, I didn't know why, but this one started gathering big old rocks and putting them in the canoe on top of Andy. I thought of asking why, but I was too beside myself with guilt. Once we were certain no one was there, we paddled out into the water, Andy at our feet. A few people walking the dogs along the shore, in the middle of the day, and otherwise we were in the clear. I had to fight down the vomit once no one was around, when we'd have to sink Andy. Swan then opened the blanket and stuffed all the rocks inside. I don't like to admit this, but I helped. I to wear the whole thing down. After they were all in there, we sealed the blanket up tight, tight as we could with the duct tape. Then, after looking around the shoreline for anyone watching, we eased him, what was him, overboard. Not that it didn't matter much. Our canoe capsized, sending both Swan and me into the drink along with the body. Swan and I sputtered. Actually laughed a bit, if you can believe it, and turned over the canoe, scrambled back inside once Andy had sunk out of sight. It was a hot day. The water wasn't very cold. But I sat there and shivered for a while, the wet dripping down my nose. Swan, though, he just grabbed his paddle and looked at me all expectant like. Like he didn't understand what the holdup was for. Like we hadn't just killed a kid from our neighborhood. A kid we'd both known since primary school. Like this was no different from dropping off a load of trash at the dump. Man, it really sets my teeth on edge every time I think about that guy. By the time we ducked, we were mostly dry, save for our squashy clothes and socks. Then the swan told me, stating the rather obvious, we couldn't tell anybody about what had happened. Ever. I don't know why it was, but just then the gravity of it all hit me. It hadn't occurred to me that we were destroying evidence of our crime. Maybe it did. I just didn't think about it that way. I just got caught up in the moment, you know. Swan seemed so sure about what he was doing that I didn't question him. Of course, later that night at dinner, both my parents and my kid brother at the table with me, well, I couldn't eat a thing. Couldn't speak even to pretend everything was normal. I felt, sure, I felt so undeserving. I didn't have a right to be there. I didn't have a right to sit at the same table as them. To sleep under the same roof. My kid brother always looked up to me. I was his hero like dad was to me. I didn't notice until that moment. That realization made me sick. It drove me just freaking crazy. Well, not wanting to give myself away. Not wanting to burden them with what I'd done. I just told them I was sick and wanted to lay down in bed for the night. There were, of course, concerns, but they didn't push. I mean, kids get sick all the time, right? Or teenagers get all moody. And that's when the real horror show started. That night while I was asleep, Andy came to visit me. It was the first time he visited me. The first, but not the last. At the time, I thought I was dreaming. In a way, I was. In the dream, I was sitting up in bed, pressed up against the headboard, white knuckling the hem of my blanket to my trembling jaw. Peering over my sheets... I saw Andy sitting on the floor right across from me. That blanket wrapped around his whole body and head, just parted to show his face. His eyes aflame with that bewildered, terror-ridden fury like before. Before Swan had smothered him. Strands of duct tape were peeling because the blanket was sodden, soaked through. The eyes didn't bother me so much. It was a trickle of water pooling on my floor from the blanket the sound of it. First a drip, drip, drip. And then a rush, like a roaring waterfall. God, it was deafening. So loud I had to cover my ears. And his head lolled down past his shoulders, hanging there, the water gushing from the creases of his blanket, flooding my room. His head hanging nearly upside down from his ruined neck. The pale flesh of his throat gnawed like the trunk of an ancient and wicked tree when I woke up. I found that the sound in my dream was caused by howling wind. 
which is blowing hard into my room through the open window. I got freaked, realizing I closed my window on account of the AC being on. Then, with my eyes adjusting to the dark, I realized I wasn't alone. There was a person sitting at the foot of my bed. I could only make out their silhouette, but it was a person all the same. I could hear a sharp flicking sound, like a pen cap being clicked, but slower, more protected, and metallic. Then I heard a voice. I realized it was Swan. Craig, he said, like he was repeating himself, trying to get my attention that long flicking sound again. I replied with something. I don't remember what I said. Letting him know I was awake. My eyes adjusting more to the moonlight. And so it was his knife. She kept unfolding and refolding, making that flicking sound. Greg, he said again. His voice all husk and flint. Did you tell anyone? I shook my head. You sure? He asked, seeing my head motion through the gloom. Didn't tell your parents. Didn't tell your brother, Rocky. All shaky and quivery, nodded my head. Sure in him, I kept my mouth shut, terrified of what would happen if he didn't believe me. After a long silence, nothing but the wind and the click of his knife folding in and out, he sighed. Good, he said, with muscular relief then folded his knife closed one last time and placed it inside his pocket. Regardless, I think I'm going to go. Go, I asked, sitting up straight. What do you mean? Go where? There's a greyhound leaving for Toronto tomorrow morning. Just a few towns over. Bigger if I start walking now. Maybe I'll get lucky and hitch a ride. I can make it. But why? I asked. Well, even in the dark, I could see Swan shrug. Only a matter of time until they find the body. And his mother's already called my house six times asking if we've seen him or if they know where he is. Sooner or later, they're going to drain Soul asking and find that body. They're going to see your parents' blanket wrapped around it. I realized he was right. My heart fell into my stomach. So, he continued. I gotta get going before they figure out what happened. Before they figure out we not only killed him, but we covered it up. When are you leaving? I asked, going on autopilot. Told me he was leaving that night. A couple of dollars and just the clothes on his back. Figuring my options weren't any rosier than his, I asked to come with him. Well, he shrugged and said, Just as long as you don't slow me down. On the next morning, after walking three hours down the road in the dark and getting a lift into the nearest town, Jeremy Swan and I took the 635 Greyhound out of Timmins for Toronto. I don't know about him, but I haven't been back since. Craig had stopped talking for a while. His head slumping down, he unscrewed the bottleneck and downed a slug of whiskey. How long did you and this Swan guy tramp together? I asked. Not long, he said, fighting back a 50 ABV belch. Stayed at a youth hostel in Chinatown for a few days. I was pretty content there, you know. Not about trying to find work in the city. Jeremy decided he wanted to keep moving. Though. Pretty soon I was out on the street anyway. No one wanted to hire a young kid without even a high school diploma to his name. What happened to the body? I needled gently. His lips closed. A mouthful of liquor. He nodded. A sound like unhappy laughter issuing out of his nose. Well, eventually, six months later, some cops met up with me at the homeless shelter I was staying at. They were missing persons detectives or something. RCMP, I believe. They were actually pretty cool about me being a runaway and all. Saying they were just interested in finding Andy or his body. Turned out they didn't find a squad after draining Saul Askin. Told him I didn't know Jack and... They left it at that. Not exactly the A-team, I guess. Well, my parents did call the shelter I was at, trying to convince me to come home, but I've been away too long to go back. So 
So I was practically 16. They couldn't legally force me to live with them. Also, I think they knew I had something to do with Andy's disappearance. So when I refused their offer, they didn't push. Probably it was their way of disowning me for what they knew I'd done. Offering me something they knew I'd turned out. Oh, I was tempted, don't get me wrong. I missed them all. The guilt. Andy's ghost drove me away. Wait a minute, I interrupted, shaking my head. Go back a little. What do you mean they didn't find the body after draining the lake? How's that possible? Greg then stared at me, a grim expression on his face, like he'd been carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. I didn't find it because Andy comes to visit me every night. I spoke so matter-of-factly that I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand. I searched his face for his meaning, assuming, hoping he was being rhetorical. But he wasn't. You mean, but well, you see him in your dreams, like that night he died? I asked, my neck goose-fleshed, anticipating his answer. Without blinking, he slowly shook his head from side to side. Nope. He muttered hoarsely. Every night, whether I'm sound asleep, wide awake, dead drunk or stone sober, I see him. I've seen him for 14 years now. Each time he's a little different. A little more shriveled. A little more, what's the word? Decayed. The blanket, which now has blue fungus growing on it, slips further and further down his shoulders every time I see him make out the broken bones through his stretching yellowed skin. The only thing that doesn't change are those eyes. Those eyes that still burn with that same look. The rage. The confusion. The terror. Every time. Those eyes. It's, it's like he's asking me the same question over and over. Why? How could this have happened? How could you let this happen to me? Why? 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 We both jumped then, hearing the dope fiend give out a long groan, no doubt in protest to the racket Craig was making. Coming back to reality, we both settled some, still feeling uneasy, but not as on edge. My courage back up, I prized a little more out of him. How often do you see him? Wetly, Craig exhaled. Every night. Every day. I gulped, a heavy silence enveloping the room. And he's your Mickey, I said, unable to control myself. Predictably, he responded with, What? You know what this reminds me of? I asked, trying to put some light in my voice. You ever watch those old samurai movies from Japan? Wheeling on me, he gawked, his eyes intelligent, almost sober, before shaking his head. Well, when I still had a roof over my head, that's what I'd watch. These old samurai flicks. Lots of kids my age like the westerns, you know. For me, I liked them samurai movies. Didn't mind reading the subtitles either. I just liked them. Well, anyway, your situation with seeing Andy's corpse or whatever reminds me of this old samurai movie I see back in the day. Throne of Bones or something like that. This guy, Waizu, Comes emperor by wasting the guy before him. Does this because a forest spirit told him to, telling him he'd be king. That same prophecy says that his friend Mickey will have his son become king after him. So in order to stop that from happening, Waizu orders Mickey and his son to be whacked. Later at a banquet with the other warriors, Waizu sees Mickey's ghost appear at the dinner, but no one else can see him. But of course, Waizu goes crazy, throwing stuff at the ghost and acting all nuts. And? Greg asked impatiently. It was imaginary, that's all. A, um, what do they call it? A manifestation of his guilty conscience. That's what these visions of your boy Andy are. Just hallucinations behind your sense of guilt. He's not stalking you from the grave, dude. You're just so overwhelmed with shame for that accident that your subconscious keeps recycling all that horrible shit you saw that day. For a minute, Craig seemed to think on this, chewing on the tip of his thumb till it started to bleed. I... 
I don't know, he muttered. I do, I insisted. Whatever. Not speaking, he seemed to search my face in the dark. Um, you sure? he asked. Yeah, I said, all hasty. You just need to try and forgive yourself. Like you said, it was an accident. It was also a long time ago. You just need to pull all this bunk behind you, you know. Just forgive yourself and this imaginary friend of yours will go away. He snickered a bit. I think you mean hallucination, not imaginary friend. Another long silence paled the room. Then occurred to me. Final question. I tried to suppress it. Afraid it would come across rude. Afraid it would tear open an old scab and covering too much pus. But, well, I couldn't help myself from asking. Did you ever see that swan guy again? Greg lifted his head, looking straight ahead. He didn't think about the answer. Yeah, he said, exhaling. <sighs> Once about five years ago, I'd been arrested in Belleville, drunk and disorderly, disturbing the peace. The police scooped me up around four in the morning, so I was set to appear before a judge around noon. After being processed, I was waiting in a holding cell, waiting for a guard to escort me to the courtroom, when Jeremy Swan lumbered in. Well, he hadn't changed much, so I had a scraggly beard and a few pounds missing around the shoulders. I tried starting up a conversation with him. I mean, still didn't like him, but I figured it was kind of nice bumping into someone I knew. When I said his name... He turned real slow, looking at me like he wasn't sure if I was real or not. He then said, Hey, more whispery. And we shot the breeze for a little bit on where we'd been in the past nine years since splitting up in T.O. Well, I did most of the talking. Him just stared straight ahead, occasionally grunting or giving one-word answers. Eventually, there was a lull in the conversation. So I asked him, he was in here behind a drunk and disorderly charge too. He said no. Asked him if he'd been locked up for loitering or trespassing or breaking and entering, stealing, drinking, any of the common hobo crimes, you know. But to each one, he said no. And a guard came, calling for him. Peeled himself off the bench, turned around and asked me, did you ever tell anyone what happened? knew he was talking about Andy, so I just shook my head and said never. Apparently satisfied, he kept walking to the open cell door, where the turnkey and some cop in a suit and tie were waiting. Before leaving, though, he turned around and said to me, you know how I said I thought we were going to toss him up instead of dropping him? A little concerned, he was talking about what we'd done so openly. I furtively nodded my head. He then said something that turned the blood in my veins to ice. I lied. I knew what was going to happen. Well, that was the last time I ever saw him. I wasn't even part of the lineup of other inmates during the arraignment. But if they caught him out of the cell for, it took a long time. At the conclusion of his story, we didn't exchange any more words. Resigned, Craig placed the bottle between us on the floor, liquor swishing around the heel. Then inched away from me a little on the couch, moving to the opposite arm. Then made a pillow of his two hands and drifted off into a drunken sleep. I watched him for a while, thinking on his story about Andy and Jeremy. Thinking about that gold watch and how much it would net me at a pawn shop. But soon after, I too had drifted off into a booze-addled doe. It was Craig screaming that awoke me, probably about three or so hours after we'd knocked off to sleep. I sat up against the couch back, clearing my vision with bald fists, my head feeling like it was split in half. There in the darkness, about eight feet from me, was Craig, looking hard into a corner of the room, yelling at something. After my eyes had adjusted enough to see him clearly, I looked over to the corner he was screaming at nothing there. I swear to you now that I searched it as hard as I could from where I was sitting, but it was absolutely empty. Unfortunately for the crackhead and me, 
That didn't stop Craig from shouting his head off, filling the whole cabin with sound and fury. Andy, he kept screaming. Andy, go away. What do you want from me? Don't you look at me with those eyes, Andy. Don't you look at me like that, Andy. Andy. I realized he was holding a plastic mickey of near-spent vodka in his hand, the bourbon bottle by his ankle, the whiskey gone. Well, he was drunk, drunker than I was, and completely out of his mind. Is that what you want? He screamed, indicating the Rolex on his left wrist. Yeah, yeah, here, he shouted, clawing blindly at his arm. Scrambling for it, the vodka still in his right hand, the gold band broke, sending the watch plummeting to the floor, the watch landing with a brassy clatter. Looked through the darkness and saw its glass casing had cracked, leaving a spiderweb fracture along its face. Craig wasn't done. For a long, eerie minute, he just stared, mouth agape into the corner, as though listening to someone speak, as though trying to read something written there. He only stopped to down the remains of the white spirit from the mickey, tossing the plastic shell to the side with a hollow <laughs> Then, in an explosion of drunken rage, he gave out a primal yell and gestured to throw the whiskey bottle into the empty corner, brandishing it by the neck. But instead... Bottle got loose from his grip while in throwing motion, circled over his wrist and fell to the floor, bounced for a bit, making a ping-ping sound, before finally shattering, sending glass shards everywhere. I watched Craig stagger on his feet for a spell, looking as though he'd spent all his rage with the broken watch and whiskey bottle. Then, in a swoon, he collapsed to the floor. He just lied there for a while, the liquor slick glass outlining his prostrate form. The junkie then groaned huskily from the darkness. Ugh, she wheezed. You and that crazy man need to keep it down. Hey, shut the heck up, I snapped, almost full-on cussing. Gingerly, rubbing my aching temples, I eased myself vertical off the couch, looking over Craig's supine body, checking fearfully if he was breathing. Bending down, almost on my knees, I breathed a sigh of relief upon seeing that he was. Then the junkie started talking again. We should get him out of here. What? I snapped at her. He's going to throw up, stink up the place. We should get him out. We're not throwing him outside. It's freezing out there. Well, maybe he'll go away. Maybe both of you. You're a trouble. Look, he's not crazy, okay? I said in as even a voice as I could. He's... He's just very drunk and been through a lot. Look, help me lift him up. Huh? Let me get him on the couch so we don't choke on his own puke. We'll lay him on his side. The dope fiend said nothing to me. Her way of saying no. Come on, I shouted. Help me get him up. Instead, that walking skeleton with skin hanging off of it just drifted away into the shadows. The whistle of her breath through her throat, the only sound. The heck with it, I muttered, bending down, straining my small, intoxicated body to pull Craig up onto his side, propping him there with his knee curled in front of his stomach. He might puke, he might not. If he stunk up the place, there are probably some cleaning supplies in here somewhere. If not, we could always start tramping again. I was about to leave Craig sprawled on the floor and collapsed back into dizzy sleep on the couch when I heard a glassy rustling that wasn't mine. Figuring Craig's leg had moved, I made a short glance in the direction of the noise. What I saw froze my heart in my chest. There on the floor beside the corner, a busted Rolex slithered across the glistening bed of broken glass, so pulled from some invisible string slunk away, and shot up into the darkness out of sight. I didn't sleep that night. In the morning, I didn't tell Craig what I'd seen. He didn't ask where the watch had gone. But I noticed, from then on, I didn't have as much trouble chasing sleep. So, uh, 
um, first of all today, I just wanted to say a big thanks to Mr. Kidden for actually not uh, being at the door meowing for this one. It's the first time in a few, isn't it, that we haven't had a, a cat serenading us while I've been recording. And also, um, today's been a bit of a hectic day. Um, the Cricket World Cup is underway. Now, that might not mean that much to a lot of you, but I'm English, so yeah, like cricket and all that kind of thing. Plus, my adopted nation, the Netherlands, is playing in this World Cup. And they're playing today, so I've kind of been recording this and then taking a break, seeing what the score is, seeing what's going on. So yeah, a little bit distracted, but hopefully um, didn't affect the quality of today's video. Anyway, my dear friends, yeah, that's another one done and dusted, another week gone. Um, like that one? Exclusive story, thanks to the author, Snickering Haystack, for sh sharing that with me. Um, yeah, an exclusive one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. So yeah much thanks again some incredible work being shared with me on the subreddit and i am eternally grateful as always well enough for one evening that's enough isn't it yeah <laughs> okay back again soon till the next time my dear friends very very sweet dreams and bye bye thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today really means a lot to me and to the author of the story of course well if you want to know more about me i'm pretty much everywhere on social media you can find me on facebook twitter instagram you can download my music on soundcloud um i've got a patreon if you feel like throw me a dollar or two very much appreciated and of course on reddit i have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written well hoping to see you all again very soon till then sweet dreams bye bye